we have that the road on arrangement and play. In the arrangement of the roads, the road on motion to pass comes next. This is not the case. If there would be a ground for a motion to pass, the motion to pass must be filed before arrangement or at least raised on the day of the arena. So this should come before the rule of arraignment and please and not that the accused was arraigned, he already entered a plea and thereafter he files a motion to watch. The very provision of Rule 170 requires that the motion to quash must be filed before the accused enters his plea, or at most on the day of the arraignment. The equivalent of a motion to quash in civil action is the motion to dismiss. But in criminal actions, the motion to quash is filed in court. In the prosecutor's office, if there would be a ground, assailing the preliminary investigation or the finding of a possible prima facie case, what is filed is not a motion to quash, but a motion to dismiss. The motion to quash is filed in the trial proper when there is already an information filed with the court. The more important part of this rule on motions to quash of course, the grounds for filing this, then the rule on double jeopardy, section 7. Requisites of double jeopardy. Then the rule on provisional dismissal. You may encounter a problem on provisional dismissal. Now you will notice among the grounds for a motion to quash, there is no such ground as litis pendentia or there is another pending case between the parties. This is not a ground in a criminal action. But in a civil case, this is a ground for a motion to dismiss. So in a criminal case, if the same incident was made subject of two cases, although the crimes charged are different, arising from the same incident, what may be the basis is only rest or is only this uh, rule on double jeopardy, equivalent of rest adjudicata in civil cases. So the fact that the incident was made subject of two different prosecutions short of a jeopardy where one case is already decided or otherwise terminated, the fact that there are more than one criminal case filed against the same accused out of the same incident is not a ground for a motion to quash. The most that could be done is to suspend the trial 
in one of the cases while the other case is being heard. But the same can only be invoked as a motion, as a ground for a motion to quash. But there is already a judgment, final and executory, in one of the cases. And that would bring about double jeopardy against the appeals. So given the situation what if, if the equivalent of the ground for a motion to dismiss in BP in the civil cases as litis and nature, this is not a ground for a motion to quash. Now under uh, the provision on double jeopardy, section 7 of rule 170, more important here are the exceptions where despite the criminal case having been already filed against the accused and even where the same was already decided and terminated, the exceptions allow the filing of another case against the same accused arising from the same facts or occurrence. You take note of this because the uh, case I told you previously on this where the amendment would be regarded merely as an amendment of form and not an amendment of substance is where there is this provision where a greater offense developed out of supervening facts arising from the same act or omission subject of the first information. Without this provision of the rules of procedure, before the fact that the accused was already acquitted or convicted, or otherwise the case against him had been dismissed or terminated without an express consent, would already bar any further prosecution. So in fact, these exceptions to the rule on double jeopardy were simply adapted from rulings in cases decided by the Supreme Court. So in these three exceptions, although factually it may appear that the accused is being proceeded against in double jeopardy, yet the provision says there is no jeopardy here. So any amendment predicated on any of these situations will only be an amendment of form, not of substance, because in these three cases the accused cannot be said to have been exposed or subject to the world jeopardy. The case of Marvin Holtman that I mentioned about yesterday against the PMK was ruled upon as merely an amendment of form precisely because the amendment was brought about by supervening facts bringing about a greater offense but arising from the same act or mission that was subject of the first accusation of no double jeopardy. 
And that is why the amendment to bring this about is regarded only as an amendment of form for purposes of criminal procedure. Second uh, exception here had been modified differently from what it was under the former rules of criminal procedure. You look closely at how the provision now is formulated. The basis now of the filing of a subsequent information or amendment to the original information is the date of arraignment for the first case filed against the same accused. Whereas before, the basis of the exception to double jeopardy is the filing of the uh, first information but done without the knowledge that there have been a grave offense that developed subsequent to the filing of the first information. Now the rule is different and the rule now is better. It is not the filing alone of the subsequent information that brings about a greater offense, but the fact that despite knowledge the, the uh, supervening greater offense, prosecutor allowed the accused to be arraigned on the original information. So under the rules now, as an exception, where double jeopardy will not arise, although the amendment or the filing of a subsequent information was made because of knowledge acquired by the prosecutor that this would involve a greater offense than the one originally filed. Previously there is no double jeopardy, but now there will be double jeopardy if the prosecutor allowed the accused still to be arraigned on the original information, knowing that a greater offense already developed after the filing of the original information. So even though there was an original information, and the another uh, information was filed because of a greater offense that supervened. If as long as the same accused has not yet been arraigned, the prosecutor should make the necessary amendment or the filing of the information for a greater offense and not allow the accused to be arraigned on the original information. And then after that, he will then amend or make the uh, new great offense subject of prosecution. The basis now is whether at the time of the arraignment of the accused, the prosecutor already knew that a greater offense developed out of the same supervening event arising from the original information. If so, under the old rule there is no double jeopardy, but under the new rule now there will be double jeopardy. 
the basis is whether the greater effect that developed out of the original information because of supervening facts became known to the prosecutor prior to his prior to the arraignment and flee of the accused. The implication is that when the prosecutor learned before the accused was arraigned that a greater offense developed out of the same act or omission subject of the original information, the prosecutor should not allow the case to proceed to the arraignment of the accused based on the uh, original information. The original information should be amended before the arraignment such that the accused will be arraigned on the greater offense already which the prosecutor learned even before the arraignment and plea of the accused. So the exception now, where double jeopardy will not arise, is where the greater offense became known to the prosecutor only after the accused was arraigned already on the lesser offense. So necessarily, the amendment can only be done after the accused was already arraigned and had entered a plea. That notwithstanding, there will be no double jeopardy. The amendment will be regarded as mere amendment of form because it is regarded under the exception not as an amendment that would subject the accused to double jeopardy. It is there that you should give more attention to understand how it is now worded. Third situation is whether the accused was allowed to enter a plea to a lesser offense without the concurrence of both the public prosecutor and the offended party. If only the public prosecutor that uh, concurred with the plea to a lesser offense, the offended party being absent, that will not subject the accused to double jeopardy if the offended party will insist subsequently for the uh, prosecution of the accused for the greater offense. Or otherwise, if the offended party agreed to the plea to a greater, uh, lesser offense in the absence of the trial prosecutor, so the state, which is the primary party, the criminal action, is absent. Now in such a case, the plea of the accused to a lesser offense cannot prevent subsequent prosecution for the greater offense for which he was originally really accused of but if she would be convicted for the greater offense, whatever penalty had been already imposed, because he entered a plea of guilty to a lesser offense, will be credited or taken as a credit to the penalty that would be imposed for the greater offense. That is why under the current rules of criminal procedure. It is required that even during the arraignment of the accused, the offended party must be duly notified so that he will have a say 
not only on the civil liability arising from the crime, but also on a possible plea bargaining that the accused may propose. The accused may propose to enter a plea of guilty to a lesser offense. Now there is nothing against this, provided that it is with the conformity of both the uh, public prosecutor and the offended party as represented by the private prosecutor. Now this, however, is subject to the restriction that there is no law prohibiting the bargaining about the crime committed. If the crime committed was drug-related or a violation of Dangerous Drugs Act of 2002, <coughs> under this new law, the bargaining disregarding the penalty imposed or the penalty more is not allowed in drug prosecutions. Under the previous law, the bargaining is not allowed only when the accusation is such a great violation where the penalty is reclusion and tetua and or death. But now no matter what the penalty for the violation is, an offer by the accused to plead guilty to an offense less, less than that charge in the information is not allowed. So this uh, exception referring to plea bargaining will not arise in drug-related cases. Another important uh, matter under the rule on motion to quash is the so-called provisional dismissal. There are two requirements here. Firstly, the provisional dismissal must be with the consent of the accused. This is precisely to prevent the accused from raising as a defense double jeopardy. If the case that was dismissed provisionally would be revived. Now secondly, the dismissal must be made known to the offended party or otherwise the offended party must be duly informed or notified of the provisional dismissal. Under these two requisites, if they had been observed, the provisional dismissal of a crime where the penalty does not exceed six years imprisonment, whatever be defined, that provisional dismissal will become permanent if the prosecution did not revive the case within a period of one year after the order of dismissal. And if the crime provisionally dismissed there is a penalty higher than six years imprisonment. The provisional dismissal, therefore, will amount to a permanent dismissal after the lapse of two years, and the same has not been revived. The two years period being reckoned under the uh, letters of this provision from the uh, date 
of the order of this result. Now you take this clarification made by the Supreme Court in the case brought before it involving Senator Lasso in this Coratón Valele case. As far as the visa with the consent of the accused, Supreme Court found this to be present because it is the accused through his counsel who initiated the motion to dismiss. So with that, it is the accused consenting to the provision of this visa. Now as to whether the survivors of the offending part of the offended party were notified of the provision of this mission, this does not appear on record. And that is why the case was remanded to the trial court for further proceedings to find out whether this second requisite for the time bar to arise is also present. But unfortunately, the trial judge simply dismissed the case and uh, did not make any findings as to whether the offended party and the surviving family of the offended party had been duly notified of the provisional dismissal. So obviously, the dismissal was not revived anymore. In the resolution of this case, Supreme Court pointed out that the provision which impresses that the one year period or the two years period in the time bar set the read shall begin to run from the order of dismissal. Now the High Court observed that is not correct. It should run only from the time the prosecution had notice of the provision of dismissal. Otherwise, the requirement of due process would be sacrificed. So the one year period or two years period should not be reckoned from the time the trial court issued the order of dismissal, but from the time the prosecution with the offended party received the notice of the court order provisionally dismissing the case. Moreover, Supreme Court clarified that the uh, time bar of one year or two years, as the case may be, does not automatically become permanent simply because there was no action taken by the prosecution to revive the case. The High Court said a resolution from the court to the effect that the dismissal has become permanent is necessary and not just the provisional dismissal having dragged for more than one year or two years. A hearing must therefore be conducted on why the prosecution failed to revive the case within the one year or two year 
time but if the prosecution could justify why the provisional dismissal was not revived within that one year or two years period, the non revival will not make the provisional dismissal permanent. Even the state is entitled to due process of law. And therefore, the agents of the state, the public prosecutors, must be heard as to the reason for its failure to revive the provisional dismissal. And not just an automatic permanency of the provisional dismissal without giving the state, through its representative, the public prosecutors, a chance to be heard why they did not revive the dismissed case within that period of one year or two years. This should be your view, because as it is, the provision is rather vague as if the provision of dismissal will become permanent if there was no move to revive the case. The impression of the Supreme Court's resolution otherwise that there must be a hearing while the prosecution shall be afforded the opportunity to state why it failed to revive the provisional dismissal within that period of one year or two years as the case may be. And if the prosecution could state valid reasons why it failed to revive the case within that period, the provision of dismissal becoming permanent will not really accrue. The dismissal remains provisional. Now finally, in this petition adverted to, the Supreme Court made a distinction between revival of the case that was provisionally dismissed and revealing of that case differently from the one provisionally dismissed. If this case that was provisionally dismissed, the same parties, the same witnesses, right, at once involved, then it would be a case of revival. This time bar of one year or two years, as the case may be, shall be heard. But if in the case new party complainants were added or new witnesses were made, the case is up for retiling and not for revival. And even if the case would be refiled beyond the one year or two years period for the revival of the case, the retiling of the case is valid. It is subject not to this time bar of one year or two years, but to the rule on prescription of the criminal action. Not the time bar of one year, but the period of prescription. 
because it is not a revival but a repiling. Now this is so as explained by the Supreme Court in that petition that one, new party complainants are added a new preliminary investigation is necessary or even if the parties remain the same, if new witnesses were called in submitting further affidavits against the original accused and original complainant, a preliminary investigation is necessary, differently from the preliminary investigation already conducted where the additional witnesses were not examined. In short, in this resolution, the Supreme Court pointed out that you must differentiate a situation where it is a revival of a case that was provisionally dismissed from a case which is not a revival but a repiling of the case that was provisionally dismissed. If it was a case of revival, the time bar of one year or two years provided under Section 8 of Rule 117 will govern. But if it was a case of refiling, this time bar will not govern. It will be the law on prescription of the crime that shall govern. So the crime, the prosecution cannot be refiled if the crime has already prescribed. But if the crime has not yet prescribed, even though the refiling was beyond one year or beyond two years, as the case may be, this rule on revival does not apply. The ponente of this view of the High Court is the uh, reported examiner in the first body uh, examine criminal law, if not in criminal law, in remedial law. So you be careful about what I'm telling you about this provision and this missile. This is a new rule under the current rules of criminal procedure. Next after the arraignment would be the scheduling of the case for pre-trial. As I said this morning, pre-trial in criminal cases is now mandatory. And you will notice that there is even the prudent among the matters that may be taken up during the pre-trial in a criminal case, possible stipulation of facts. Before, in a decision of the Supreme Court, no less, stipulation of facts is not allowed in criminal cases because the accused has the right to remain silent, to compel the accused to enter into a stipulation of facts would violate this constitutional right of the accused. In order not to be inconsistent with what has already ruled on this matter, you now have these requirements under the rule on pre-trial in criminal cases, Rule 118, that all agreements made by the parties in a criminal case must be signed by the defense counsel and the accused himself to be admitted in evidence. If 
not signed by both counsel and the accused. The same shall not be admissible in evidence. So you take note of this. A stipulation of fact when only the defense counsel signed, the accused did not sign, is not admissible as evidence in a criminal case at all. I told you that as far as pre-trial is concerned, while you were thinking of civil procedure, that you should know the difference between pre-trial in civil cases, pre-trial in criminal cases. Those points of distinction have been asked in the bar exam more or less than twice already. You notice under the rule on pre-trial in criminal cases, there is no requirement for the defense to submit pre-trial brief. So although the rule on pre-trial in criminal cases is specified, what are those matters that may be taken up during the pre-trial, it does not require the defense to submit a pre-trial on those matters, to submit a pre-trial brief on those matters. Now likewise, there is no non-suit or default as the case may be for the failure of the offended party to appear or of the accused to be present during the scheduled pre-trial. The court is authorized to resort to its prerogative power to determine whether the non-appearance of the prosecutor or the non-appearance of the accused may be a basis for judicial sanction. And if so, the prosecutor who did not appear will be a subject of such sanctions. In the case of the accused, if he were on provisional liberty, his jailer would be the bondsman. In fact, the notice for the accused to appear in any proceedings in court, if he were on provisional liberty, should be given to the bondsman. And the bondsman should be the one to bring the accused to the court where his appearance is required. Failure to do so, the court will issue an order for the bondsman to explain why his bond should not be forfeited in favor of the government. For the bondsman to prevent the forfeiture or confiscation of the bond that he had filed for the provisional liberty of the accused, he should explain two things. Firstly, why he failed to bring the accused before the court during the scheduled time when the presence of the accused in court is required. Secondly, he must produce the accused before the court. One without the other will not excuse the 
for picture of the body. The two must be met before the court may uh, allow the bond to stand and not be forbidden. If it was a cast bond, even though the accused was acquitted, the cast bond shall not be returned to the bondsman or to the accused, if it was the accused who posted the cast bond. Supreme Court ruled that the cast bond, by way of bail, should be assessed with the cost of suit and other expenses incurred during the criminal proceedings and only the balance will be released to the bondsman or to the accused as the case may be. Now after the pre-trial, the court, just like in a civil action, shall issue a pre-trial of death. In this respect, pre-trial in civil cases, pre-trial in criminal cases are identical. There must be a pre-trial order issued by the court reciting what transpired during the pre-trial conference and this shall guide the prosecution and the defense on the course of action that will be followed during the trial. So the parties should not enter into trial without having received the pre-trial order from the court which conducted the pre-trial conference. After the pre-trial order had been received, the case now goes to trial on the merits. As to the a rule on trial on the merits. The important aspect here is the right of the accused to a speedy and public trial. You will notice that under the rule on trial in criminal cases, there is a specified period within which the case must be disposed of, trial must be completed. This period is useless. A criminal case cannot really be decided within 120 days. And now, it should be 80 days because the period initially began and depreciated, becoming shorter and shorter. See? The rules of trial provide, however, circumstances that will justify a postponement and uh, During that period of postponement, the total period required for disposing of the case will not include those periods. Actually, the courts cannot complete the trial within the period set without sacrificing the right of the accused. 
because it's simply that the witnesses either cannot be made available or the witnesses come to court but they cannot be heard because the court calendar is made to involve supposed trial of around 10 cases daily, sometimes even more than this, whereas the court can only hear three or four cases a day because of the direct examination and the cross-examination and the redirect and the recross. So many cases have been postponed from day to day without the limit stated under this rule. So as far as that period is concerned, this is disregarded and disregarded only as directory. But the accused may raise the point of delay in the trial of the case contrary to his constitutional right to a speedy trial. But a speedy trial does not mean that there are no delays. In fact, the Supreme Court has explained that reasonable delays are part of a speedy trial, cannot be avoided. So if this is a matter that is relative, you cannot really limit the period during which the case shall be tried. So the way the rule on trial was formulated is more violated than honor. They cannot be complied with. Now more important on the period within which trial should be conducted is the right of the accused to move for the dismissal of the case on the ground that his right to a speedy trial is violated. Now that remains to be seen. But if a motion to set the case for hearing was filed before the defense could file a motion for the dismissal based on the delay in the trial, that motion of the defense will be considered already waived. If the prosecution is past there in setting the case for trial on the merits, anyway, that motion can always be undertaken. So even this can be circumvented. Most important part of the rule is the demurrer to the evidence. And of course, the distinctions between demurrer to the evidence in civil cases, demurrer to the evidence in criminal cases. When we were discussing the rules on civil procedure or civil actions, I brought to your attention the distinctions between the two demurrer. A demurrer in a civil action, a demurrer in a criminal action. So by now, you must know which is which. And I pointed out to you that demurrer to the evidence in criminal action is more stringent than demurrer to the evidence in civil cases, which should not be. The rules of demurrer in criminal cases should be more lenient because the accused should be allowed all the leniency 
for him to maintain his innocence of the crime charge instead of hurrying him up to file the demurrer within an unextendable period of 10 days. So if the defense counsel is busy with some other case that is also rushing, the demurrer cannot be filed within that period. Whereas in a civil action, there is no such time restraint. At most, the rule on the murder in criminal action should be the same as the rule on the murder in civil cases, except that if the murder was in a criminal case, this cannot be subject of an appeal because of the rule against double jeopardy. But as far as the procedure, the rule must be the same. If there is no need for legal court in filing a demurrer to the evidence in civil cases, there should also be no such requirement in a criminal case. To expect this in a criminal case brings about two situations. That if the demurrer was filed without prior legal court and that demurrer was denied, the accused loses his right to present evidence in his defense that this should not be allowed in criminal cases. This may be better in civil action, but not in criminal cases. The accused should be allowed all the opportunity to present his evidence because he may really be innocent of the crime charge just because of the technicality he goes to jail. This is wrong. I wonder why they have made this rule like this. It should be the other way around. They should be more strict in civil cases because after all, this is only payable in money. But not in criminal cases where the offender will pay for his inaction or delay with his liberty. But that is the fact as the rule goes. So you should know it as it is. After this comes the rendition of the judgment. A distinction is made between a judgment of acquittal and a judgment of conviction. A judgment of acquittal becomes immediately final and executory and therefore no appeal therefrom may be taken as otherwise the accused will be subjected to double jeopardy. If the accused was acquitted, the judgment is required to state whether the acquittal was based on reasonable doubt or that the acquittal is based on the fact that the facts charged do not constitute an offense. This has an effect on the accused or on the offended parties recovering damages or civil liability from the 
accused, even though he was acquitted on reasonable doubt. But not when he is acquitted on the ground that the facts on which he was prosecuted does not exist. If it turned out that he is not the accused who really committed a crime, then his acquittal will not be based on reasonable doubt, but rather based on the ground that the facts do not really constitute an offense by the accused. So in such a case, even a finding of civil liability is not proper because the accused would not then be answerable for the act of omission, the act of omission that brought about the prosecution. Unlike in a decision, in a civil action, I already told you that in a civil action, the decisions are merely rendered, they are not propagated. But in criminal actions, it is not enough that the decision is probably is uh, rendered, it must furthermore be promulgated. And therefore, whereas in a civil action, it is enough that the judge be still a judge at the time the decision was rendered in a criminal action that will not suffice. The judge must still be a judge, not only when the decision was rendered, but moreover, up to the time the decision was promulgated. The judgment, whether in a civil action or in a criminal action, is, from, is uh, rendered when the decision, after having been completely prepared, supposedly by the judge himself, the judge has already signed this, and the same is transmitted to the clerk of court for recording in the book of judgments. So up to the time it was delivered by the court to the clerk of court, that judgment is rendered. Now in a criminal case, the judgment does not end there. Clerk of court will set a day for the promulgation of the judgment. So the clerk of court must still set a date for this purpose, notifying the prosecution and the accused of that date for them to appear in court during the promulgation of the sentence or of the judgment. In the promulgation of the judgment, the same is to be done in open court, where the judgment is read to the accused. Actually, only the dispositive part of the judgment is read. The body of the decision will not be read because this may really involve several pages that for the, the court to require that this will be read in total would be time consuming. In the uh, case of uh, people versus Hubert Webb, the trial judge there 
Judge Amelita Tolentino, now a justice of the Court of Appeal, caused the judgment to be rendered, to be read in total, and it consumed the whole afternoon. <laughs> starting from the beginning of the findings down to the dispositive portion. The judgment being a reiteration of the facts found after reciting all the evidences adduced by the prosecution, evidence adduced by the defense, then stating the evaluation made. The recital of the evidences presented by both parties consume more pages than the interpretation made by the court in arriving at the conviction of the accused. And it really is time consuming. So in uh, more uh, cases than otherwise, the judgment is promulgated only by reading the dispositive portion of the judgment. The promulgation must be done in the presence of the accused, except when the offense involved is only a light offense, where the rules allow that the promulgation may be had even in the absence of the accused and only his defense counsel being present or a representative also of the accused being present. After the promulgation is made, copy of the judgment is given to the accused, the accused sign for that to attest to the fact that the judgment has been promulgated. So the accused signed this, the counsel of the accused is also required to attest the fact of promulgation by also signing the same copy signed by the accused. Now you will see the inconsistency of the rules here. In the arraignment, the arraignment cannot be done other than in the presence of the accused. Arraignment cannot be done with the accused being absent and only his defense counsel being present. Yet, in the final result of the trial, the accused may be absent. Only the counsel may be present or representative of the accused may be present if the crime charge was only a light offense. The former rule was liberal. The accused may be absent during the promulgation of the judgment only if the crime is punishable by fine. Because then, the lawyer can simply pay the fine. Or the representative of the accused may simply bring the money to pay the fine. But if this sentence imposes a prison term, it must be the accused himself who need be present during the promulgation of the sentence. And that is because the counsel will not be allowing himself to be in prison. So, he is not allowed to represent the accused in the promulgation if the crime involved is punishable by imprisonment. 
because the decision whether to appeal or not is personal to the accused and the council cannot substitute for this because if the accused would weigh his right of appeal he goes to jail then and there sentence will commence to be served but this cannot be done by the lawyer the lawyer cannot waive the right of appeal otherwise he will be arrested he will be the one jailed that is why the former rule is better the absence of the accused during the promulgation of the sentence only allowed if the crime involved is punishable by a fine. Well, there is a prison term involved, only the accused need be present, not by counsel or representative, during the promulgation of the sentence. Because only the accused can decide whether he will still appeal or he will already commence serving the sentence. Now, also, it should be understood that if the accused has been held during the promulgation of the sentence, the accused is not a bail. He must be personally present during the promulgation of the sentence. Now, if it was a light offense, it is uh, excused if the accused will not be brought to court. This is not so if the accused is being held. The accused must be brought to court because he has the say on whether he will still appeal or not. The period for finality of the sentence is 15 days from the day of promulgation of the judgment. So the 15 day period will commence to run from the time the judgment is promulgated in criminal cases. Compare this to the uh, judgment in civil cases. The period for finality is not uniform at 15 days. There are instances where the period is 30 days because a record of appeal is necessary. Now in criminal cases, that is not so. The period of finality, 15 days from the promulgation of the sentence. Although the sentence in a criminal case has to be promulgated because this is a requirement of the rules of criminal procedure, yet in a case where the decision of the trial court in a criminal case was one for acquittal, on the date of the promulgation, the accused did not appear. Ordinarily, the court should issue an order for the arrest of the accused because the promulgation of the judgment in a criminal case is a necessary part of the procedure. So it cannot just be weighed or for gun with. But the Supreme Court ruled 
that in as much as the decision is one of acquittal, when the clerk of court simply sends a copy of the decision to the accused, the judgment is thereby promulgated already. And therefore, it has become final and executory because judgments of acquittal are immediately final and executory at their promulgation. But if the court at that point ordered the arrest of the accused, then that judgment of acquittal will not be considered promulgated because the court has still jurisdiction over the accused. Although the decision written by the court is one of acquittal. Now I just want to do for you to know that in such a case where it was a decision of acquittal, the Supreme Court considered the judgment as promulgated even without the accused appearing in court. The accused was merely notified with the copy of the judgment sent that was being sent to him. <coughs> and that was construed as promulgation. The press period rule has not been applied in criminal cases. So even if the uh, accused would file a motion for reconsideration or a motion for new trial, the period for appeal or finality of the judgment will be 15 days from the day of the promulgation of the judgment, not 15 days after the denial of the motion for reconsideration or motion for new trial. Now do not apply the press period rule to criminal cases unless the rule states clearly, like in the petition for certiorari. Judgments in criminal cases may attain finality firstly through the mere expiration of the 15-day period from the day of promulgation of the judgment. Secondly, even though the 15-day period has not yet lapsed, if the accused himself manifested to the court in right that he is not appealing the decision anymore, from that time on, the judgment has already become final and executory. The waiver of the right of appeal must be in writing. So although the accused initially may make the manifestation oral, if that was so, the clerk of court will require the accused to write on the margin of the paper where the decision is written and promulgated, his uh, written undertaking that he will not appeal the decision anymore. And he will sign that attested by the defense counsel. So from that day on, the counting of the period of the sentence will already commence to run. This is common when the accused after all 
cannot afford to post bail bond so that during the trial he has been there. The sooner he will uh, commence serving the sentence, the sooner he can finish serving the sentence. So he goes out earlier. Instead of appealing the case only after the appeal has been decided and the decision has become final and executory, may the sentence be considered already served. Another instance where the judgment in a criminal case becomes final and executory is where the accused had commenced serving the sentence totally or partially. Now you may be thinking how he could serve sentence partially and in effect render the judgment against him final and executory. This takes place when the penalty imposed on the criminal uh, liability of the accused consists of a prison term and a fine, or a prison term or a fine. And the accused, upon the promulgation of the sentence, pays the fine. If the penalty is only a fine, payment of the fine will amount to a total service of the sentence. If the penalty is imprisonment and fine, he pay the fine, he will yet serve the sentence, then that is a partial service of the sentence. Once this is done, no partial appeal can be done because that act renders the sentence final and executory. Or, if the accused would file an application for probation, so do it. The judgment which necessarily is one of conviction becomes immediately final and executory. So these are the instances when the judgment in a criminal case would become final and executory and therefore the accused cannot avail of any of the remedies available to him under the rules of criminal procedure. In civil procedure, you have learned that when the defendant files a motion for reconsideration, his ground, therefore, must be any of those specified under Rule 37 of the Rules of Civil Procedure. If the motion for reconsideration was not based on any of the three specified grounds, the motion is deemed to be pro forma. And as I told you before, a pro forma motion is one which is simply dilatory. And therefore, the filing of such motion will not interrupt or suspend the running of the period for appeal. In criminal procedure, you notice there is no such ground specified 
on which a motion for reconsideration of the judgment is allowed to be filed. The rule is lenient to the accused to file a motion for reconsideration on any ground that he may think is deserving of the court to consider. Hence, the pro forma rule does not apply to criminal cases. Since the rules of criminal procedure do not prescribe the ground upon which a motion for reconsideration is allowed to be filed on any ground that the accused may deem to be impressed with merit that the trial court should consider, the accused can file a motion for reconsideration. Now here again, only one motion for reconsideration need be filed. Filing of a motion for reconsideration will suspend and interrupt the running of the period for appeal. So the period will resume after the motion for reconsideration is denied. Now, if the civil action for the recovery of civil liability arising from the crime is deemed to be instituted with a criminal action because the accused did not make any reservation to file a civil action separately or the accused has not filed a civil action ahead of the criminal action, the civil action is being filed with the criminal action. Under the present rules of procedure now, the civil liability that may be recovered in a criminal case out of this rule that the civil action is deemed to be filed with a criminal case is limited now only to those arising from the crime. So for those civil liability not arising from the crime, this may be subject of a separate and independent civil action. Unlike under the former rules of procedure, well, the civil liability that goes with the criminal action are those arising from the act or omission subject of prosecution. So not only those arising from the crime, but arising from the same act or omission. That is why under the former rule on this, or recovery of civil indemnity, even though arising not from the crime, but from the act that brought about the crime, should be filed in the criminal action. Otherwise, they cannot be made subject of a separate and independent civil action. The rule now is better. Only those which are arising from the crime committed are then filed in the same criminal action against the accused. 
Now, although the recovery of the civil liability arising from the crime is still piled in the same criminal action, when no reservation is made in respect that of the period for finality of the judgment of the court with respect to the award of the civil liability or civil indemnity is not coterminous with the period of the judgment insofar as the criminal liability is concerned. As far as the recovery of the civil liability is concerned, the judgment rendered by the court in the criminal action will allow the offended party the full 15 days for which the judgment will thereafter become final and executory for the offended party to avail of whatever remedies available to him in respect of that civil liability. So it does not follow that if the uh, accused who after conviction and on the day of the promulgation of the sentence manifested to the court that he is not appealing anymore. So he is waiving his right to appeal. So thereupon, on that same day of the promulgation of the judgment, the judgment becomes final and executory, hence no longer appealable. It does not follow that the judgment in so far as the criminal liability arising from that crime is concerned, it will also become final and executory on that same day. In short, in a criminal action, you will have a situation where the judgment on the criminal liability is already final but the judgment in respect of the civil liability or civil indemnity is concerned is not yet final. So even where the accused is already serving the penalty for the criminal case, the offended party may still questioning the sufficiency of the award for the civil liability. If the offended party is not satisfied with the amount awarded as civil liability to him, he may file a motion for reconsideration and that would only be in respect of the recovery of the civil liability. This is precisely because the judgment in a criminal case is not to become final and executory what as to the civil liability of the accused and the civil liability, the, both as to the criminal liability of the accused and the civil liability of the accused arising from the crime. This is not the case. The, as far as the civil liability arising from the crime is concerned, it will become final and executory after the lapse of the entire 15 days for the finality of the judgment. Whatever the accused may do that would render the a criminal liability immediately final and executory will not be binding upon the recovery of the civil liability arising from the same crime. This was made a problem of the bar exam before in the remedial law. And the notion of many is that since the judgment is already final and executory, no part of the proceeding could be had. As a matter of fact, if the offended party filed a motion for reconsideration demanding a higher indemnity plus the civil liability, 
or plus the damages arising from the crime. If the trial court denied this, the offended party may yet appeal the judgment insofar as the recovery of the civil liability arising from the crime is concerned. This is because that civil liability is purely within the interest of the offended party. The interest of the state only is on the criminal liability. So you fall down back to the rule that are done by the offended party will only extinguish the civil liability but not the criminal liability. But that is not his business. In the same way, pardon by the chief executive will only extinguish the criminal liability but not the civil liability. You have these respective provisions of the code in Article 23 and Article 36 of the Revised Penal Code. And this is the predicate of this procedural consequence that even if the sentence is already final as to the criminal liability, it will not be final yet as to the civil liability. Now, if the offended party not satisfied with the award of the trial court of the civil liability due to him, he may appeal. But that appeal will not be in the name of the people of the Philippines anymore because he is not authorized to represent the people. So he will pursue the appeal in his own name as against the accused. But the reference to the docket number of the criminal case will have to be disclosed for purposes of reference to the records of the case. So it is uh, better that you have an idea of this uh, mechanics of the criminal proceedings and not just you knowing what the rules provide. Aside from the motion for reconsideration, the general remedy against an adverse judgment in a criminal case is appeal. The appeal may be ordinary appeal or it may be by way of a petition. Now you also have the so-called automatic review, but this is not true anymore because the capital punishment had already been virtually abolished. So there is no capital offense anymore. The provision of the Constitution on automatic review applies only to uh, cases where the death penalty, because it is prescribed by law, is the penalty imposed by the trial court. Now, as far as the other penalties of life imprisonment and reclusion perpetua are concerned, these are under the appellate jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. So normally, cases where this penalty is imposed must be appealed to the Supreme Court. The same is true to those offenses 
when the penalty is lesser than life imprisonment or reclusion perpetua, but were committed on the same occasion as the other crimes punishable by reclusion perpetua or life imprisonment had been committed, that they may be raised to the High Court in the same appeal. But the Supreme Court had issued administrative memorandum that all cases appealed to it must be caused through the Court of Appeals. Supreme Court is unbarding its docket because it cannot cope with the appealed cases to it anymore. So on the lame excuse that the magistrates of the Court of Appeals are in a better position to appreciate the facts of the case, and therefore intermediate appeal should be provided for. These four cases now course through the Court of Appeals. If the Court of Appeals will find that a lesser penalty than life imprisonment or reclusion perpetua is proper, it can render the decision without elevating the matter to the Supreme Court. The philosophy adopted by the Supreme Court and laid down in the case of people versus a friend, Mateo, is now generally applied to all cases which originally are directly appealable to the Supreme Court to at least delay the elevation of these cases to the High Court, the High Court required that this must be caused through the Court of Appeals. So the appeal to the Supreme Court is not the wrong appeal. Hence, in a case where the appeal was directly brought to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court did not dismiss the appeal. The Supreme Court instead remanded the records to the Court of Appeals or so on to the ruling in the case of people versus a friend, Mateo. But had it been an appeal which is not within the appellate jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, the High Court will not remand it to the Court of Appeals. A proper or incorrect appeal will be dismissed. But in the case of these cases where the penalty is reclusion perpetual or life imprisonment, it's really appealable to the Supreme Court. Only it is the Supreme Court who wants to rid itself of the burden of reviewing the case. So it issued an administrative memorandum directing that all such appeals shall henceforth be done through the Court of Appeals by way of intermediate review. Now if the Court of Appeals upon review would find that the penalty of life imprisonment or reclusion perpetual is not proper but a lower penalty is deserved, the Court of Appeals can already render the decision and release the decision by way of promulgating the Zenith. Now if the Court of Appeals find that the penalty is really reclusion perpetual or life imprisonment, this penalty is not within the competence of the Court of Appeals to impose. So the rule says not that the Court of Appeals will evade the records to the Supreme Court. The rule says the Court of Appeals will prepare already the decision 
and then elevate it to the Supreme Court for approval only. The High Court is avoiding the hardship of reading all over again the reports of the case. Because when the case goes to that level of the High Court, you can expect it is voluminous already. <laughs> so it will require time. They cannot finish reading the records of the case in one day. They will have to take so much time reading this. And with the volume of cases that they have not decided for several years, they will not be able to complete these cases until the death. So the Court of Appeals will prepare the judgment. But the Court of Appeals will not sign the judgment because that is beyond their competence to render. The appellate jurisdiction is with the Supreme Court. So they will just forward the record to the Supreme Court and if the Supreme Court finds that the judgment rendered is proper, as assessed by the Court of Appeals, then it will render the judgment. All of these modifications in the procedure are brought about by convenience. It is not really the intent of the law that there be another appeal, so-called intermediate review. And this delay the disposition of the case. The principle that justice delay is justice denied seems to be a myth now. It is simply a dream. Because this has not been actually observed. So tomorrow we will be discussing the rule on the search and seizure. We may even be able to finish this in the morning. I said if there is any aspect here which may not be clear to you yet, you have not been involved in court practice or in the offices. All of these rules may appear to you merely as imaginary. You cannot understand the workings of the rule unless you know the setup. So write down whatever aspect may not be clear to you. So I can at least uh, enlighten you on how to begin your answer, how to approach the situation. Uh, you may be looking at it at the wrong direction, looking at the matter at the wrong direction is a tragedy. I uh, think I already told you about the lawyer who mistook the prosecutor as the accused. So when he was assigned by the court to act as counsel the official, he refused and asked the court that he be accused, he, uh, he be revealed. So the judge asked him why. You are a lawyer. The court is assigning you as counsel the official. But he argued that under his own as a lawyer, he's not supposed to defend the case where in conscience he believes that the accused is guilty. So the court asked him, what made you believe that the accused is guilty? So he said, just by looking at the face of the accused, <laughs> this representation is convinced that he is capable of committing the crime. <laughs> Until the judge told him, come say you are looking at the fiscal. <laughs> the accused is dead. <laughs> So it is the fiscal mistake is something 
that cannot be inconsistent with innocence. <laughs> so we will observe this matter of uh, search and seizure tomorrow. The only rule left for us. The other rules there are merely routinary. You focus on the rules where I discuss with you the mechanics of the case. And one question you may encounter also is what is a prejudicial question? The idea of a prejudicial question now is substantially different from the idea of the prejudicial question before. Under the previous rules of criminal procedure, and even under the opening chapter of the civil code, the term prejudicial question refers to any question arising in a civil action the resolution of which is determinative of the guilt or innocence of the accused in a criminal action. And jurisdiction of the which is in a different tribunal. Currently, prejudicial question in criminal cases had been limited only to those arising from a civil action far ahead of the criminal action. So although indeed it is a prejudicial question, if the civil action when it arose was filed later than the criminal action, the same is not regarded as a prejudicial question that would suspend the criminal proceedings instead of the civil proceedings that shall be suspended. So do not miss the new concept of this, only for purposes of criminal procedure. This is to prevent defense counsels from delaying the case by filing a civil action in order to stop the criminal proceedings. To avoid that, simple. Only civil action filed ahead of the criminal action may bring about a prejudicial question. So I think we also deserve to rest. So let us uh, call the day off. We should tomorrow on that specific rule 126, then rule 127 on provisional remedies. Until tomorrow then, thank all of you. Thank you, last issue.